reception of Izmir this year, so please enjoy it and to have in your memories for the next year to come. Uh, and so I'm very happy to be chairing the session. I'm Emilia Gomez, I'm one of the PC chairs this year and uh, we will have a very nice uh, set of presentations. We are missing one author, uh, uh, presentation F4, like Elad Liebman, if he can come here, please, uh, to, okay, now it's here. <laughs> so we will start uh, with, the, with the first presenter, the first poster presented by Gina Lee, on the influences on the social practices surrounding commercial music services. Hi, uh, I'm Jin Han Lee from University of Washington Information School and um, I'm happy to present a paper that I wrote with three master's students who all graduated. Uh, one is in the middle of the internship, one is up in the mountain hiking and doing some soul searching, and the other one who was supposed to be here just got a job and couldn't make it. So I am going to do my best to channel them as I present our work. They didn't make me a fancy video, so we'll just do it an old-fashioned way. Um, so the big motivation for our project comes from the fact that the evolution of the music technology tends to outpace the research. And we felt the need to basically update the research on people's social music behavior for all these new technologies. So the participants that we talked to, uh, who are fairly young, um, they have all adopted the access-based model, so they don't have their music collection anymore. Uh, they couldn't imagine why anyone would try to actually share the music file itself. They thought it was actually quite silly when everybody can go to YouTube. Um, and they also were often using the smart home devices like Amazon Echo or Google Home to play the music instead of interacting with websites or apps on their phone. So what we wanted to do was to basically see and try to build on the previous research that people have done on social music behavior and try to see what has actually changed or stayed the same. So the research questions that we had for our paper were, what are current social practices surrounding commercial music services, and what actually influences these social practices? So for that, we adopted a focus group as our primary method so that we can get some rich data uh, so that we can identify all these different social actions and needs that people have. And based on the findings, we created a model of social practices and influences that provides a lens through which the social music experience could be understood. And in this model, there are nine distinct social practices and 24 different influences, which are grouped into three, these three categories. And I clearly don't have time to go over all of that because I have about one minute and 40 seconds left. Um, but I wanted to at least give you an example of many different kind of social situations that showcase um, the complex interplay of these different influ influences. So for that, I'm going to ask, how many of you have used Uber or Lyft previously? All right. So of those of you who raised your hands, how many of you have requested the driver to play a specific song or use the Spotify or Pandora feature to actually play the song yourself? Oh, that don't work for Pandora or Spotify. <laughs> um, so our participants agree with you. A lot of them said that they have never used it and they will probably never ever use it. But why? And according to Rebecca, whatever you're thinking is probably wrong, right? So if you want to know the answer, please come to the poster session. It's poster number one. <laughs> and I will tell you the correct answers from the users and also be happy to tell you more about our model and these different kinds of influences and share more stories. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gina, for the presentation. Uh, there is a small change in the program as the, uh, the next poster. The, unfortunately, the authors couldn't make it, so we will directly go to the third poster in the, in the program, which is F3, uh, that is presented by Kotset uh, Sukuna, uh, which is called Listener Anonymizer, Camouflaging Play Logs to Preserve Users Demographic Anonymity. Hello, I'm Kotset. 
First of all, I love music recommendation. It can improve users' music experience. To improve recommendation accuracy, it's beneficial to predict users' demographic attributes like age, gender, and nationality. Even if a user doesn't register such demographics, they can be predicted with high accuracy by using the user's payload. And thanks to the technique, users can get more sophisticated recommendations. But as a researcher, I think it's also important to think about the counterbalance. So what's the counterbalance of the technique to leverage prelogs for predicting users' demographic attributes? Yes, it's a technique to camouflage prelogs for preserving users' demographic anonymity. Based on this idea, we propose a system with an anonymizer. Let me give you an example story so that you can intuitively understand how listener anonymizer works. Emma is a 22-year-old French female. She uses both an online music service and listener anonymizer. And she considered her nationality when she signed up to the service. Every time she plays a song on the service, listener anonymizer computes a probability distribution over nationalities like this. And now suppose when she plays 21 songs, listener anonymizer detects that her nationality can be predicted. So it shows an alert message like, your nationality can be predicted as French with a probability of 67%. And it also shows anonymizer icon. When she presses it, listener anonymizer computes the effectiveness of each song, each song to anonymize her nationality. Then it recommends two effective songs to Emma. By playing these songs, now her prelogue is camouflaged, and the service can no longer correctly predict her nationality. This slide shows an example result of our evaluation. When a user plays 30 songs, we can anonymize her age by recommending only three songs on average. And here is a more concrete result. Now, this user's uh, true nationality is Polish. And when she plays 30 songs, the distribution is strongly biased to Polish, like the leftmost graph. But she can cam camouflage her prelog by playing only three songs recommended by listener anonymizer. Now, you may not want to use listener anonymizer, but we think it's important to show that preserving user's demographic anonymity is technically possible, because it can give a choice to a user. So if you don't care about your demographic anonymity, it's OK not to use listener anonymizer. In such a case, you can get high accuracy recommendations. On the other hand, with listener anonymizer, you can enjoy music while preserving your demographic anonymity. It's your choice. Finally, because listener anonymizer camouflages prelog, it might degrade recommendation accuracy. But we dared to propose this controversial approach to raise privacy issues in this community. I'm looking forward to discuss this new research topic with you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Next paper is uh, presented by Elad Liebman on the impact of music on decision making in comparative tasks. No, no, just sound. Just, just. Okay. No, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Oh, can I do this? Yes. Um, so thanks for uh, listening. Um, this is joint work with Corey White and my advisor, Professor Peter Stone. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a bit about work that we've done on um, <clears throat> how music affects people's behavior in, a, in an environment where you actually have to reason about other people's intentions. So there's a lot of research, and we've done some research, on the fact that like, emotion, emotion, mood affects 
your emotional processing and your uh, cognitive decision making, etc. And we know that music induced mood can actually affect um, your behavior in different contexts. But how it affects your behavior in contexts which require interacting with others hasn't been sufficiently explored. So just to uh, contextualize this, uh, in previous work that we, I presented um, at the Ed Izmir in 2015-2016, we've already shown that um, music can affect, no can, does affect how you uh, decide on classifying the emotional context of, context of words. For instance, uh, people were much faster and more likely to classify words as positive versus negative when listening to positive music. But also interestingly, uh, in the context of you know, non-emotional content, like deciding whether to accept or reject gambles, um, people who listened to positive music were faster to reject bad bets and uh, accept good bets, for instance. So these complicated, n you know, non-stationary effects of listening to music uh, happen in different contexts. But we have really, haven't really looked into how that changes when we're interacting in a social setting. So in this experiment, um, the person is driving a simulated car. It's the red car on the bottom. Um, and there's also an autonomous vehicle that's controlled by an artificial agent that's crossing the intersection at the same time. And we wanted to see whether the interaction of the person reaching the intersection, it's a four-way intersection, it's unsigned, so there's a lot of open room for interpretation. Um, and the person has, has limited control. It can either accelerate, decelerate, or break. And we did this experiment repeatedly. Um, each trial ends when both vehicles are you know, reaching the end destination. And they keep doing this while listening to different kinds of background music uh, with their headphones. And this is repeated in a counterbalanced fashion among different kind of like behavior profiles for the autonomous agent, the blue card. It can be more aggressive or less aggressive, slower or faster. Um, it can give right of way always or only a certain percent of the time, etc. And we want to see whether there's a difference in how people behave. And the answer is there is, but it's not exactly something that's easy to categorize from a, a behavioral standpoint. Because, for instance, um, people who listen to sad music um, kept a lower minimal distance. Like they were less mindful of how far or close they were from the other autonomous car. So that's like a less social behavior. But on the other hand, people who were listening to happy music w were generally driving faster, which um, is, makes them less likely to give right of way when reaching the intersection, and also makes them drive more recklessly. And something that I omitted but should be mentioned is that if both cars you know, impact, they crash and the trial ends, and the, the, the subject is cautioned about the dangers of reckless driving. <laughs> so they don't want to crash, hypothetically. Um, so these interactions, by the way, are accentuated, especially in situations where the blue car, like the autonomous car, wasn't obviously giving right of way. Um, you can see this, these results are pretty, you know, statistically significant when you look at them um, in terms of, you know, f faster uh, driving and also a larger margin. Um, there's also, we can actually break this down to how different musical aspects, like you know, the ratio of positive chords or the tempo or the loudness correlate with how fast you drive, et cetera. So it actually, you can actually correlate this with musical properties. And with that, I will conclude. There's no time questions, but you're welcome to catch me at my poster. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, an interesting presentation. We uh, continue with the following uh, paper uh, presented by Emmanuel Hinas uh, that is called Venue Rank, Identifying Venues That Contribute to Artist Popularity. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Manos Hinas. I'm uh, here on behalf of uh, Center for Research and Technology from Greece. And uh, I'm going to present you a work uh, conducted in the framework of a Future Pulse EU uh, project. So, we can agree that artists need exposure on uh, wider audiences. So, the question where to perform is uh, quite relevant. We need, therefore, rankings of events uh, contributing on uh, exposure and uh, artist popularity. The questions are three. Uh, what data to use, 
to calculate uh, this exposure, how to use this data, and also how to validate the rankings we produce. <coughs> in, uh, in this work, uh, we formulated artists and venues as a bipartite graph, and we, we applied graph ranking in order to produce rankings of artists and venues in, in a joint uh, manner. Uh, in general, in uh, the related uh, literature, there are many uh, bipartite uh, ranking uh, algorithms. Uh, these methods typically use an iterative formula starting from uh, uh, prior rankings for the two type of nodes. And in the long run, uh, they produce a stable solution. However, uh, they require uh, well-defined uh, priors, which is difficult to obtain. So, uh, we propose venue rank, which is uh, actually a pretty generic uh, ranking uh, method that eliminates uh, the effect of prior ranks and also has guaranteed uh, convergence. Uh, to evaluate uh, the rankings we produce, we used uh, 542 uh, artists and uh, the events they have uh, performed uh, by using Facebook API. Uh, and also for half of them, we have uh, actual uh, number of listeners from Spotify Analytics for the same period as the events. Now, to create uh, ground truth, that is quite challenging, uh, we defined two uh, classification, uh, binary classification problems, namely to predict popular and not popular artists and uh, trending and uh, not trending ones. Uh, we used uh, venues, uh, previous venues as features, and by applying feature extraction, we get uh, venue scores that uh, serve as a ground truth. Now, by these are some baselines we used. Now, by measuring the Spearman correlation between the ground truth and uh, venue rank uh, alongside other baselines, we can see that venue rank uh, has a, a a high degree of uh, correlation, and it is uh, also robust. So, to sum up, we can say that there is a clear link between uh, graph structure and uh, exposure. So, by using that type of uh, methods, we can have in, in an unsupervised way a rankings of uh, venues and artists uh, that represent, uh, let's say, reality. So. Uh, by using venue rank, we can also uh, eliminate uh, the rely on uh, prior uh, scores. That's all. If you have any question, uh, you can find me on uh, F5. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we, um, uh, the next poster, uh, or sorry, the next paper is presented by Eva Sangerle, and it's titled The Many Facets of Users Modeling Musical Preference. All right, so my name is Eva Sangerle from the University of Innsbruck, and I'm presenting work on content-based user models, primarily used for uh, recommendation uh, scenarios. So if we look at uh, how user models are traditionally treated in MIR, we can find, let's say, three different groups of user model approaches. One being the collaborative filtering approach, where we simply model a user by means of the IDs of the tracks that he or she listened to. That is completely agnostic to content, obviously. Now, another approach is kind of oversimplifying a user model, taking uh, content features of the tracks the user listened to and simply taking the average across all those tracks the user listened to, across all the features. And the third approach traditionally is to cluster tracks into clusters of similar use, uh, uh, similar tracks, sorry. And um, what we normally see here are gosh, mixture models and some k-means clustering, for example. Now, what we wanted to see is how do those actually compare how do the, who do, what do we use? What should we use? Which kind of user models? And what, we, what our goal is basically uh, to find a user model that more or less holistically models a user's preference toward certain music 
and specifically towards music in certain situations, certain contexts. So we want to find a user model that is, that is able to uh, represent a user that likes to listen to calming music. For example, classical music as well, when sitting on the couch, but as well as the same user wanting to listen to motivating, pushy music when, for example, doing sports. So this is what we want to incorporate into this user model, both of these worlds, many of these worlds. So what we did is we did a, a, a large-scale study, and we, what we did as well is we simply looked into the building blocks of the user models that are out there and tried to recombine them and find a combination that works really well for those different contexts. So those building blocks naturally are related to the uh, three types of, of user models that I just presented. So one is taking the average, the other one are clustering approaches. Um, and here we, we uh, did play around with, for example, the clustering approach itself, but also how do we actually assign a user to one cluster, to many clusters? Do we use a weighting scheme, for example? But also uh, we experimented with the representation of those clusters. How do we represent such a cluster? And um, we did a study on obviously combinations of those as well. And uh, what we then did is a large scale study on that. And I'll just present you with my takeaways uh, on that study. So what naturally, or what we expected to not work well are averaging user models. And that was confirmed in our studies. And aggregation wasn't that much better, honestly. But what we find is that when combining an aggregation approach and um, the averaging approach, this actually led to the best performance by far. As you can see, an F-score of uh, 63 when compared to the individual ones uh, that are in the 20s. So our conclusion here is that if we do a user model that basically combines the user, let's say, general tendency towards music preference with context-specific models that are captured by uh, the different uh, clusters, that actually works best. And if you'd like to know more about this work, just drop by Poster F6. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuva, for your presentation. The next paper is presented by Ji Yong Park and it's titled Representation Learning of Music Using Artist Labels. Hello everyone, I'm Jiang Park from Naver. I'm gonna present our research representation learning of music using artist labels. Most researches to get a picture representation of a song use description labels such as genre or mood tags to train a network. However, such semantic words are often ambiguous to, to, to classify a song, so there is a lot of noise in the data set. Most of all, it is hard and time consuming to get a high quality annotation. So we propose a method to train a network to clash by input audio in, to clash by info audio to, to the artist instead of tag labels by considering every artist has his or own musical style. We used one-dimensional conversion neural network using mass spectrogrammetic input. There are many advantages to using the artist labels. First, they can be obtained easily as are they, are, they are annotated naturally from the album release. And second, they are objective information with no disagreement. And third, the artist labels may be regarded as terms that describe diverse styles of music. However, this basic model has two main limitations. One is that the output layer can be excessively large if the dataset has numerous artists. That means if the dataset has 10,000 artists and the last hidden layer size is 100, the number of parameters to learn in the last of the max weight metrics will, be reach, will reach 1 million. And second, whenever new artists are added to the dataset, the model must be trained again entirely. Therefore, we also propose another model to solve the limitations by using the Xiamis DCNN and Max Margin Hinge loss. Xiamis model consists of twin networks that share weights and configuration. 
We trained the model using narrative sampling, and by using this technique, they could effectively approximate the full soft max function when the upper class is extremely large. We compared the performances of these three models by regarding them as picture extractor after training them to the same data set size. We applied the learned audio picture to the Zhangna classification and similarity-based similarity retrieval to, as a target task using three different data sets. The results show that the proposed model outperformed or comparable to the model learned with semantic tag labels, although the artist labels are incredibly easy to get compared to the tag labels. In addition, we also discussed the advantages and disadvantages of the basic model and the Shamis model. The Shamis model is more effective in the similarity-based tasks, but it tends to slightly overfit to the training set. And finally, we show that these models offer from the previous state of the art in the genre classification. These visualizations provide a better insight on the discriminative power of the learned pictures. You can check our implementation from these links, and for more details, please stop by our poster F7. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, the next paper is presented by Shri Kancherla and is uh, titled Structure Net Inducing Structure in Generated Melodies. Good afternoon. I'm Shri Kant from Duke Tech. And on behalf of the first author, Gabriele, and the rest of my team that uh, contributed to this work, I'm pleased to present Structure Net, a neural network for inducing structure in machine generated melodies. So musical structure consists of uh, repetitions, variations, and transformations of musical motifs that uh, can pertain to melody, rhythm, instrumentation, timbre, and dynamics in a piece of music. And structure is a key feature of uh, music composed by human composers. It gives the piece a sense of overall coherence and intentionality, and also induces a sense of familiarity in the listener when he listens to the piece. So what we are particularly interested in is durational and intervallic repetitions in melodies. As you can see in this um, image, there are blue squares surrounding segments in a melody that um, repeat um, previously occurring segments in the same melody. And the shade of blue indicates whether this repetition is a duration repetition, um, duration and interval repetition with or without transposition. And this is separated by the, uh, from the, the repetition is separated from the original segment by what we refer to as look back, which is the distance in uh, crotchets between these two segments. So the problem we found with uh, melody models when uh, used on their own is that uh, they tend to generate uh, uh, melodies which are coherent locally, but globally lack uh, good structure, which it's, uh, I refer to as meandering here. They're also poorly structured and uh, make limited references to uh, previously generated material. So in order to address this shortcoming, we introduce StructureNet, which is a recurrent neural network, an LSTM, that induces structure in machine-generated melodies. It works in tandem with a melody model that predicts a sequence of musical notes. And uh, StructureNet uses uh, the structural elements implied by the melody so far to alter the melody model's prediction so as to produce a more structured melody in the future. So this is how it works. Um, given a melody, which is a sequence of notes, and a sequence of structure tags that we associate uh, with the melody, the structure net deals with the sequence of structure tags and the melody model with the series of notes in the melody. The melody model first predicts a probability distribution over the possible notes uh, that can continue the melody. And at the same time, StructureNet predicts uh, um, a probability distribution over the repeat types that uh, um, are possible now. For, um, you, and each, now what we do is then we uh, reweight the probability distribution predicted by the melody model. Um, 
with, uh, by the probabilities of the uh, uh, repeat types that uh, each uh, melody implies, uh, such that uh, um, it makes it more conducive to melody notes that uh, have more structure. And uh, we then sample from this uh, modified probability distribution a note. And uh, from the set of possible repeat types that this note can imply, we sample the, uh, uh, the repeat type. And this process is repeated once again um, over time. So we evaluate this uh, uh, method um, by, uh, on the Nottingham data set by computing a set of uh, statistics over the data set and sets of uh, generated pieces by, with and without the structure net. And these are uh, um, um, statistics related to repeat quality and general musical quality. We find that uh, generation statistics match data set statistics better with StructureNet than without it. Of course, there's a lot more to this work, so do visit us at poster F8, and uh, we look forward to speaking to you more there. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, now the, the next presentation is, uh, will be done by Diego Furtado Silva, and uh, the paper is titled Summarizing and Comparing Music Data and its Application on Cover Song Identification. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm Diego. I'm from a univer uh, Federal University of São Carlos in Brazil. Uh, and now I'm talking about, about summarizing and comparing music data, and I show an application on cover song identification. So basically, uh, our method is based on this pipeline. Uh, when you have a query and you need to compare it to a reference data, uh, instead of comparing the raw song or a long feature vector, uh, we compare it to summaries that are really short uh, vectors uh, of features that somehow summarizes the, the whole song, right? Uh, this is not completely new. Some people did this before me, uh, but we are proposing some novel ways to sim uh, summarize the songs, right? Uh, and they are based on simple, uh, which is a way to summarize uh, the self-similar rate matrix, right? Uh, and then we use two strategies on simple uh, to do that. Uh, the first one is, is based on similarity. So basically, if you have a snippet that is faithfully repeated in your song, uh, it must be a summary. Uh, and the second one, is a kind of thumbnailing thing. Uh, so if the snippet is approximately repeated many times, it must be a summary. But more important than that, uh, it's diversity. We're, we all like diversity, right? Uh, and it's important here. So we have some ways to provide diversity to these uh, snippets that are in the summary set. Uh, also, because we are applying cover song and we are using Chroma, uh, we store the global pitch profile for key invariance. That is the first step of the comparing uh, phase. So uh, we first uh, shift one of the songs, specifically the query. So the summaries and the query have the same key, OK? Uh, and then uh, we use the Mwins algorithm for similarity search. It's based on the Euclidean distance. Uh, we use this for, for fast calculation. Uh, and then we have one Euclidean distance uh, from the query to each of the summary. Uh, then we aggregate them by the geometric uh, mean uh, with benefits the low values. And OK, so what do we do with this? Anything that needs to uh, some similarity comparison, we apply this on cover song to validate our approach. Uh, and here are some results on popular song. Uh, the, the last two things are ours. Uh, so we have even better results summarizing uh, than our previous, previous work, and kind of similar to the 30 less uh, that applies more robust features than we did. Uh, this is also true for uh, classical music, uh, but if it's not as good as applying uh, robust features, so why to use this? Uh, because it's 30 times faster uh, than our previous work there, was already fast enough. Uh, OK, so with this, we can use a little bit more time uh, to push the retrieval efficacy, like uh, using dynamic time warp instead of uh, Euclidean distance. And then we prove even more results. So now we have uh, something that is really fast and even better than applying more robust features. Maybe we can mix those things together. 
uh, but this is our, our last result in the paper. So if you want to talk about cover song identification, come to my poster. Uh, if you want about, uh, to talk about summarization, poster, uh, or music data similarity in general, uh, you know the answer, please come to my poster as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. We are now uh, going to the 10th uh, presentation in this session. I, I wanted to remind you that next year is not the 10th, but the 20th edition of FISMER. Uh, so if you, if you want to know more about uh, what we are planning to do, uh, please don't miss tomorrow the society business meeting. Uh, and we will also sh uh, discuss about the things we have been doing in the board. Uh, so, um, uh, I wanted to, uh, now there's a 10th presentation by Wei Tsung that is titled Transferring the Style of homo Homophonic Music Using Recurrent Neural Networks and Autoregressive Models. Oh, hi, good afternoon. So today I'm presenting the topic of transferring the style of homophonic music using recurrent neural networks and autoregressive models. The authors are Wei Zhong Liu and Li Su, and from Academia Seneca, Taiwan, and Wei Zhong Liu. So first, I would want to give you the department definition in our work. People have tried to do style transfer in different domains, like audios or expressive styles in instrument playing. And in our setting, we hope to transfer the style in symbolic domain. So the task would be re rearranging the style of a given homophonic music piece while preserve the essence of that piece. So as you can see in the figure, we, the elements like melody or harmony progression, these elements we want to preserve is the elements that help us recognize the song. And the other parts like harmony set and rhythm is the, is the element we want to rearrange. So the data representation in our work is piano roll. So in order to perform the style transfer task, we have to find a way to model the st style. So we proposed a neural network structure, which is composed of a debug and wavenet model together. The generalized debug will accept information from future and past and condition the wavenet part to output probability of occurrence for interested note in certain time step. And the reason for this kind of design is that we hope to model the joint distribution both in the time axis and pitch axis. And with the model, we then can use the Gibbs sampling to transfer the style of given pieces. As you can see in this figure, there, are, there is a blue block in, in the middle which represents the element in a matrix. So when sampling, the blue block will be, con will be conditioned by the green part and ignore the red part because of the Kazo property in WaveNet model. And the whole transfer process will be we randomly pick a um, block on the score and update it and pick a new one, update it iteratively until it converge. So here we have some examples for you. Uh, the first I played will be the original one. Oops. Whoa. Okay, this is the second one. <laughs> Let me play the original one. <laughs> and this is also a song, also a sample for jazz transferring.
So if you want more details, please come to our posters. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. The next pre uh, paper is presented by Gino Brunner and is the title MIDI by Modeling Dynamics and Instrumentation of Music with Applications to Style Transfer. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm here to talk about our paper MIDI VAE, Modeling Mu Dynamics and Instrumentation of Music with Application to Style Transfer. So from the title, you could probably already guess that we're doing some kind of automatic music generation. And to no one's surprise, we're using deep neural networks to do this. But from the beginning, we were not just interested in creating music or generating music, but also in somehow using our models to transfer the style or um, genre of different music pieces. However, in order to do so, it's important that the underlying representation of music is very feature rich so that you can distinguish style uh, easily in the first place. Therefore, when going from MIDI to a piano roll representation, it's important to um, preserve much of the important information. The first thing is, of course, trivial, is to just model the note pitches like it's done in the standard piano roll representation, and we call this the pitch roll. We model polyphonic music by simply extracting multiple voices from the MIDI files, and then we encode the instrument assignment for each of those voices in the instrument roll. Next, we model the loudness of notes in the velocity roll. And finally, the duration of the notes is also implicitly modeled by combining pitch and velocity rolls. And then we end up with this final um, feature-rich representation of symbolic music that hopefully uh, contains a lot of information pertaining to style. Now, what are we doing with this exactly? So this is a very simplified picture of our model, which is based on a beta var variational autoencoder. It just uh, takes an input sequence and tries to reconstruct it at the end. To force our model to contain, uh, to learn something about musical style, we attach a style classifier to the top two dimensions of the latent space, which then essentially forces the encoder to do style classification and write the result at this exact location in the latent space. The decoder then uses this latent style label during the reconstruction phase. Now, this allows us to perform style transfer in the following way. We simply feed in a music piece in a source style. Then, in the latent space, we swap this learned latent style label and feed it to the decoder, which then performs the style transfer. In order to evaluate this, we train some um, separate style classifiers on, uh, and then use them on the data before and after the style transfer. On our classic test data set, 87% of bars are correctly classified as classic. And then when we do the style transfer to jazz, 61% of those bars are now classified as jazz. Now, somewhat unsurprisingly, the biggest contribution to this is coming from the instrument assignment, uh, which is also the easiest thing to learn for the models. Here we see what happens on average when we go from jazz to classic. So, uh, there's not much going on in the diagonal. This means that most instruments are, of course, changed when we do the style transfer. We can also see that um, many of the instruments are mapped to piano, strings, string ensembles, and reed instruments, which makes sense since those are heavily featured in classic music. Our model can also perform uh, smooth interpolations between pieces of music, which can be used to uh, produce medleys. The cool thing is that not only the note pitches are interpolated smoothly, but since we model velocity, the model can fade notes in and out smoothly and dynamically change the instrumentation as well. Um, we got also some cool results by mixing songs in the latent space that produces then some uh, non-trivial mashups of those songs. So all our code, all your samples, and the data we used is available online. And if you're still interested, you can come talk to me at my poster, F11. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. The next paper uh, is titled Understanding a Deep Machine uh, Listening Model Through Feature Inversion, and it's presented by Somitra Misra. Good afternoon, all. My name is Somitra Mishra, and I come from Queen Mary University of London. 
Um, today I will be talking about our work to understand a deep machine listening model. This is the joint work done with my supervisors, Bob Sturm and Simon Dixon. So let's start with motivation first. We know machine learning is a very powerful tool, and when, when this is combined with lots of data and computational resources, we get state-of-the-art results. But I hope you also know that there are lots of problems. Problems because these algorithms are black boxes, and we know very little about how theoretically and empirically do they work. Moreover, we can easily train an adversarial example to change the prediction of any model. So, given a model for a particular task, if we want to ask question, is the model trustworthy? Is the model fair? Is the model reliable? What can we do about that? Well, the answer is to bring interpretability to your model, which is also called as explainable AI these days. Let me give you an example. This is, a, this is a model which is trained for a medical diagnosis system, which takes it a set of uh, health parameters and predicts whether the, mod, whether the patient has flu or not. If we apply interpretability to it, it tells whether the, the features sneezing and headache voted in favor of the model and no fatigue voted against the model. In ISBA 2017, we presented, we extended this technique to MIR. So now what we did in this work, we tried to understand a deep vocal detector, which is a model that takes in some form of time frequency representation and applies a confidence score which tells uh, about presence and absence of vocals. Now how did we do that? We use a technique called as feature inversion. The idea is when we train a CNN, each layer of the model throws away information which is not useful for the task. So if by some way we can invert these features back to the input space we, and visualize them, we can understand what is being preserved and what is being not preserved. We applied this technique to a deep vocal detector, which is a state-of-the-art model, which, takes, which is an eight-layered CNN that takes in a ML spectrogram and applies a probability to it. And what we did, we basically inverted, for every input, we inverted all the intermediate layers and visualized those time frequency representations. Here are some of the results. Uh, the first row represents an instrumental instance, and the second row represents a vocal instance. And from convolutional layer one, we move to the most, uh, to the deepest, that is the fully connected layer eight. You can visualize that the last layer does not preserve any temporal or harmonic content which was present in the input. Similarly, we also found that the last layer, which is the fully connected layer, uh, acts as some sort of a decision function, which is frequency sensitive. That is, we found that whenever there is singing voice present in the input, the inverted representations have high frequency content in that. Moreover, we can, you can also visualize that these representations are much and much blurrier as we move inside, which tells us that more invariances are being captured in the deeper layers of the model. We also experimented this with RWC dataset to see if these generalize. And we found that these results do generalize across the datasets. So I would like to say that interpretability is a very crucial tool. And if we want to improve and understand our models, we should be willing to use it. Uh, for more discussions and collaborations, please come to our poster F12. And the code and all experimental results are available, will be available soon online. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, the, the next one is uh, titled Comparing RNN Parameters for Melodic Similarity, and is presented by Tian Chen. Hi, everyone. I'm Tian Chen from uh, ICE Japan. So today I'm presenting comparing our par parameters for melodic similarity. So the work was all right. <laughs> so the work was done with Satoru Fukuyama and Masa Takagoto. Uh, so melodic similarity was trying to uh, compute similarity between melodic uh, sequence. 
So pre previous methods like uh, added and distance engrams and uh, uh, geometric measures have some problems like they need alignments and also uh, they're based on local features. So in order to tackle these two problems, we propose to present a melody by using parameters of its, its generative RNN. So the key idea is, is showed as uh, in the feature that we train an RNN to generate an identical melody as the train data. So we think the RNN parameters can capture the global features of the whole sequence of the melody. So in order to use it for uh, mel melodic similarity, we first train individual RNs on the melody individually. Then instead of comparing the melodies, we compare the RN parameters. Uh, if uh, parameters of RN B is more similar to A than C, we think the melody B will be more similar to uh, melody A than melody C. For a directly comparison, networks are trained with the same architecture, um, initialization, and a train strategy. So with this fixed setting, we can, um, every time when we train on one melody, we can end up with the same uh, RNN. So the advantage is that uh, because all the uh, models will have the same dimension of parameters, so we don't need a line anymore and a generative RN can capture the, um, can represent the corresponding melody globally. Uh, in the experiment, we uh, choose eight, uh, 80 clips from uh, RWC dataset, so uh, 27 participants vote for the melodic similarity for two pairs of the clips in previous study. Uh, each dot here represents the uh, similarity vote for each pair. So we first train an RNN on all the clips, then use it as a, an initialization to train individual RNNs. Um, we compute the sim, uh, cosine similarity between the RN parameters. Then we compile the uh, computed similarity based on the uh, RN parameters to the ground truth uh, as the uh, human vote. Um, the results here show, uh, shows that our, we, we compare, if we compare the RN parameters, it works slightly better than the original pitch sequence. So to conclude, we propose to use the generative RN parameters to present the melody and to use it for analyzing melodic similarity. Okay. The, uh, but there's still some limitation of this method. It's like uh, the, uh, the RN have too many parameters and uh, the parameters will, will um, have subtle difference, so which we want to ex explore more. Uh, thank you for attention. For more details or if you have any discussion and suggestion, please come to my post at F13. Thank you. <laughs>
and amplitude. And uh, most of you uh, know uh, the well-known spectrogram where we basically add the third dimension here, uh, where we, we get, uh, we still keep time. We project amplitude on a color scheme, and then we add another uh, axis on frequency. Uh, I was a bit uh, frustrated by this uh, display, so I was wondering whether we could go a little bit uh, uh, beyond. And so it's called the uh, spectral stack display, and it has been inspired by reading uh, this really nice paper by uh, Lee Byron and uh, Martin Vattenberg that I recommend you to read. Um, it's not using a deep neural network, unfortunately. Uh, it's uh, more simple. So you took audio and then you use a melt scale spectrogram um, and from the energy of each of the spectral band, basically you stack them. So that gives something like this, where uh, basically um, color is not, no longer used for energy, it's used for the frequency, okay? So you have time, amplitude as the waveform, so it's, when it sums up, it sums up to the overall envelope, but here, for example, by dark blue, it means low frequency, and there is not a lot of yellow, but uh, uh, yellow means uh, high frequency. Um, so you can hear the, this sound. So it's a church bell sound, so you can see here clearly uh, the decrease of uh, the overall amplitude, but also the decrease of the higher, higher frequencies and the beating uh, phenomena. Um, so there, are, there have been some design choices. Uh, it's a simple implementation, but uh, um, it's interesting to, uh, to discuss. And we validated uh, using uh, two case studies, one about uh, musical timbre discrimination from visual displays, and also about the uh, assessment of uh, saxophone uh, playing techniques. Are you able to quickly recognize if you made a mistake while playing? And uh, if you want to come and discuss the pros and cons of the proposed display, uh, please come to uh, F14. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. The next paper is uh, presenting two web applications for exploring melodic patterns in jazz solo, and it's presented by Klaus Friller. Yeah, hello everyone. I'm waiting for the screen. Yeah, I'm presenting two web applications for exploring melodic patterns in jazz solos. Um, this is a project done uh, as part of the Dig That Leak project with an international cooperation in applied music information retrieval because we want to address musicological and jazz research questions using MIR tools, the whole set of it. And patterns are of special interest in any music, but particularly in jazz, because we know that they are used to shape jazz improvisation. They are also kind of an oral, oral tradition in jazz, patterns one, wander from one performer to the next. Also, quotes and external references to other kinds of music are interesting. Um, the data is still not there, the off automatic transcription, but we are promising results. But we still got the Weimar Jazz database where we can use to build prototypes of user interfaces because we address musicologists, the user, having good, usable, uh, accessible interfaces is as important. So we designed first the Pattern History Explorer. This is the Shiny app, which is an R package to make websites directly from the data. And for this, we picked up a more or less random set, but important set of 653 patterns from eminent performers like Charlie Parker, Miles Davis, and so on. And then we looked it up in the Weimar Jazz database and find 11,000 instances of these patterns. And they're all pre-calculated and contained. And we have audio and also score, which is important for musicologists to provide a score, otherwise they don't 
like it. And also listening to the parents is very interesting and gives uh, many insights. We have some filtering options, metadata, performance, length, and so on. Um, but I just want to give you one example of the most common pattern, which happens to be the bebop scale. So these are already six instances, and the earliest one. As you can see, Charlie Parker is really fond of this, like a textbook example of the bebop scale and C dominant. But the first one was actually Charlie Stavis, which was a swing trumpet turn, also Wall Eyelids. So patterns start in bebop, but they actually did precursors in the late swing alphas. And also you can see the timeline plot of a pattern where who played it when. Of course, only in the Weimar Jazz database, but now I think we have our 30,000 tracks. Then this plot will look much more interesting, but it's already giving some insights who likes this pattern a lot. But this is all pre-calculated, so if you want to look for general patterns, you have some idea, then you need to, another tool, and this is the second application, this is the pattern search, or the dig that pattern search. Um, it's based on the Weimar Jazz database, but we have also two comp other corpora uh, for comparison, like the Essen Folkson collection, also a coding of the Charlie Parker Omnibook. Here we have m much more uh, types of um, viewpoints, not only intervals, but also many different transformations of pitch mostly. You have some features, regal expressions, you can have audience score snippets again, so you can listen and see it. Uh, metadata filter, you can request some context and so on. So if you're looking for Santa, maybe it's a little bit too early, so you input your favorite Christmas song in the database, and yeah, there is one instance, and that's how it sounds like. So. Thank you very much. You can meet us at the poster and uh, ask questions <laughs> or just visit this. Thank you very much. Um, next presentation is by Matthias Dorfer. And the title is Learning to Listen, Read, and Follow. Score following as a reinforcement learning game. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Matthias Dorf and I'm presenting joint work with Florian Henkel and Gerhard Wittmer and I will talk about how to formulate score following as a reinforcement learning game. So given the incoming audio, the task of a score follower is to track the corresponding position in the score. In our case, these are images uh, of sheet music. Reinforcement learning, on the other hand, is the computational approach to learning from interaction and its mathematical foundation are Markov decision processes. All right, the key idea of our paper is to formulate score following as a multimodal Markov decision process. This is cool because it allows us to address it with state-of-the-art deep reinforcement learning algorithms such as the advantage actor critic. Um, we can discuss all the technical details at our poster, but for now I would like to use the time to show you a short video that shows how an A to Z reinforcement learning agent gradually learns to listen to music, read the corresponding sheet music, and then follows the corresponding position in the score. What you will see in the video is the input to the agent's policy network. This is a sliding window of sheet music and the spectrogram of the currently playing music. As a visual aid, I also plot the agent's position and the target position where the agent actually should be. What the agent controls is the reading speed in the score. Okay, let's start training the agent by interacting with this score following game. It's important to note that the agent learns its behavior on a set of training pieces. What you will see in the video is its performance on a completely unseen test piece. All right, this is an untrained agent, so it obviously fails. When it fails, what we do is we set, reset it to the beginning of the score and it has to practice all over again. Still fails. Yeah, this was way too little training time, so we train for a couple of more epochs. It's doing already a little bit better, but as we see, it doesn't work. 
This is reinforcement learning, so some more epochs. So this looked already quite promising, and after roughly two days of practicing reinforcement learning, this is what we end up with. So the agent is now able to follow completely unseen pieces in images of sheet music all the way through the end. And it also is able to deal with quite severe tempo deviations. So this will be now a very slow piece in terms of pixel reading speed. The agent immediately recognizes this and slows down its reading tempo. And in the next, uh, in the next piece, um, this is kind of the masterclass in terms of pixel speed at least. If you watch the pink speed bar, this is what the agent controls in order to match the target position in the score. And it has to really work uh, hard to, to match the corresponding position in the score. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, keep in mind that all of this is really learned from spectrograms and images of sheet music. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So if you're interested in score following and or deep reinforcement learning, um, you can find us at poster 16 in the front somewhere here. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much uh, for the demo and the presentation. And we arrived to the last presentation of, uh, of uh, our presentation at this year, ISMER, which is uh, provided by Olivier Gouvet. And the title is uh, Matrix Co-Factorization for Cold Start Recommendation. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Olivier Gouvet, and uh, today I will present our work, Matrix Co-Factorization for Cold Start Recommendation. So first, uh, collaborative filtering is a technique used uh, for recommender system, which is based uh, only on the historical uh, data of users. This uh, information can be summed up in a matrix Y, where in, in the row you have the user, in the column you have the songs, and each entry of the matrix Y is the number of times the user listened to a song. Uh, this matrix, Y, uh, can be approximated by uh, a low rank product of two matrices, W and H, where W is a, the, will correspond to the preference of the users, and H to the attributes of the songs. To infer these uh, two matrices, uh, we aim to uh, minimize the kubak labor divergence between Y and the uh, reconstruction W time H. One uh, well-known uh, limitation of uh, uh, collaborative filtering is the cold start problem, which is if you have a new song in your catalog, uh, you cannot infer the attributes of the song. For example, if you have a column of zero in Y, you will have a column of zero in the corresponding uh, column of H. So to deal with this problem, uh, you can uh, use features about the songs. Uh, in our paper, we use uh, tag, tag information. One way, one way to do this is to perform a joint factorization of your two matrices of observation. Uh, so you have two modalities. The first one, Y, A, which are the listening counts, and uh, Y, B, which are the tag information for all the songs. And uh, the attributes of the songs are linked um, and share information. In our paper, we, we choose to, uh, to say that uh, uh, the attributes uh, patterns of uh, the songs are shared, but uh, that uh, the songs can have different scales uh, which are represented by the diagonal, uh, diagonal matrices NA and NB. To infer this parameter, uh, we aim to minimize this uh, cost function, and uh, we do this by uh, 
apply a majorization minimization algorithm. Uh, so for the evaluation, uh, we use uh, two data sets, uh, the taste profile data set for the listing counts and the last FM data set for the tag information. We evaluate uh, our model on uh, two tasks, uh, in prediction and out prediction for the cost uh, recommendation. So uh, if you have uh, any question or if you want to know more details about this work, please uh, come to the poster number 17. Thanks. Thank you very much. So before closing this uh, oral session, because uh, please don't, uh, don't stay here, uh, we would like to share some information with you. First, uh, I would like to, uh, to ask you to consider and making your voting for the best uh, oral and poster presentation. You can uh, decide until tomorrow after the late break demo, and there will be a box next to the, to the entrance of the, of the conference site too, so that you can have your, your vote. So please don't forget to do it. Maybe now it, it's a moment. Uh, then uh, the second announcement that I would like to, to do is uh, about uh, the new um, journal that uh, the ISMER uh, community is, uh, is uh, having. So if you had uh, some interesting ideas for, for a new work or, or for extending your work and you don't want to to wait for the next conference is still uh, is now open uh, for submissions, and uh, Pastor. Uh, and before passing the word to Gael, I wanted to thank all the speakers and also the organizing team because we saved uh, almost 15 minutes of the session thanks to them. So thank to all the speakers in the session. Yeah, and I can, what I can add, I can th thank all speakers of ISMIR because I've been quite impressed that we've almost never heard the applause from the machine, which means that it was, you were incredibly good at uh, keeping the, the timing and which makes it uh, work, I think. Uh, so thank you very much. So yes, I would like to come back a little bit by, from, uh, to the boat information. So the boat, uh, the boarding of the boat will uh, probably start uh, at 8, maybe even a little bit before. You can go there a little bit before. It's no problem. The weather is very fine. Uh, it's a nice place. It's uh, very close to the Eiffel Tower. Uh, we'll try to, to board, uh, well, not in a rush, but uh, the boat is planning to uh, depart uh, 8.45, maybe a little bit later, but not much later than that, because as I explained uh, this morning, the boat has specific constraint to, to be on a specific spot on the Seine River at a specific time. Uh, what else I would like to say? Um, uh, some people from the local community team are setting up uh, the instrument, the musical instrument on the boat. So there will be uh, guitars, bass, drums, uh, microphones, and um, well, a number of things. Uh, so it should be work. It, it will be uh, on place and uh, ready to be played uh, at nine, at eight. So uh, for the jam session, you you have uh, uh, now. It's also it's one more thing which is uh, closed. You cannot put your name anymore on the list to play. But the good news is that uh, there should be some time to just do a a real jam session where you don't know what to play and you just step on stage and say, okay, I want to play this tune. Who wants to play with me? So that will be possible. I look at the list. So uh, currently it is planned to have a first jam session of rather soft music for the entrance, for the boarding. Uh, there are not that many tunes uh, planned in this first session. So maybe there will be possibility to do real jam session of soft music uh, before we close the first uh, pre-banquet uh, music. Probably we'll close up the pre-banquet music at the time the boat leaves. Okay, and then you have uh, the post-banquet uh, uh, music where there, there is about 40 tunes planned. So uh, before the jam starts, it will maybe uh, 
the real jam, I mean, uh, where you can play any tunes that you have not planned in advance. <laughs> we'll start maybe later. Okay, I think uh, that's it for, uh, for tonight's event. Uh, uh, the other thing I can say that uh, it's not, uh, it's mirror is not finished. First, you have the poster session of the oral presentation you have just seen, as usual. As usual, you, you will have the first row, you will have to, uh, to move because we are going to uh, pack the, the chairs for, uh, for the poster to come. And there is also many more things tomorrow morning, and starting with um, late, late breaking demo session for the first uh, an hour and a half. There will be plenty of poster all around. And uh, then you will have uh, the results of the votes, uh, society meeting, and a uh, number of other things before having in the afternoon the meetup with industry, which we hope uh, will be a, a nice and, uh, and quite um, interesting event for meeting the industry and for industry meeting uh, ISMIR and uh, the students and, uh, and so on. Well, I think that's it. Did I forget something? Um, some more information. So to remind you how to go for the, for the board, um, for the banquet. So you have the map in the booklet. Uh, it's at Quai de Grenelle for those who use Google Maps or GPS, just type, type Quai de Grenelle. Uh, there is a metro station, which is a Birakheim, which is really close to here, which is line number six of the metro. So it's not very complex uh, to go there, just follow the instruction on, uh, on the program. Uh, another an announcement, we will start voting for the best oral presentation and best poster presentation uh, at uh, 5 p.m. So they will be, um, the ballot box will be just located um, at the desk in front of the cloakroom, just uh, in this corridor on, uh, on the left part. So you, everybody can compete for the um, best oral presentation and best poster presentation. So be sure to have seen all the poster of this session uh, before voting, be because maybe the best one is, is in, uh, in this session. So because of that, the vote will remain open until tomorrow morning after the late breaking session. So as Gail mentioned, the program of tomorrow morning is 60 uh, different poster presented. So that's both the late breaking demo session and 10 Marex posters. After this session, we will close the vote. We will just count the, uh, the number of votes for uh, each uh, role and each posters, and we will present the, result, the results at the closing session right after the coffee break. Okay, so maybe you will be the winner of the best oral or best poster. So you better show up because if you're not there, we give it to someone else. Okay, so be sure <laughs> to be there. So now we are sure that we will have at least 100 participants after the banquet, which is a big bet because usually the session after the banquet, you have less people. But uh, if you have the award, you're not there, we give it to, to someone else. Um, so that's uh, about the information. As usual, we will move to the poster session. So I will ask the first three. Oh, one more thing, as, as we'll say, uh, Stephen. Um, one more thing. Uh, there is a number of, of items that has been lost in the room. Uh, if, you, uh, if you have loosened so, something, just go to the registration desk. So there is still this uh, hotel key from Ibis. Uh, if, if you are staying at the Ibis Hotel and you lost your access card, it is at the registration desk. There are other strange items like that, so be sure to have all your belongings. Uh, if you have not, they are uh, at the registration desk. So now we move to the poster session, so I will ask the first three rows to move to another seat or in order that we change the setting of the room. <laughs> 